Well, hello, hockey fans. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or whenever you decide to tune us on. Welcome back to the Hockey Writers Live. It is March 11th already, just 32 days in front of the NHL's trade deadline. I figure this would be a perfect time to have an all Winnipeg Jets episode. We're going to have our panel a little bit later on, but right now we are honored to be joined this week by Sportsnet's Sean Reynolds, someone who has the pulse of the Winnipeg Jets just about as good as anybody out there. Hello, Sean. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Mark. How are you? I, I'm doing well. I guess that's my first question. How are you doing? How are you doing? How'd you do with the pandemic? And how does it feel to be back covering games once and for all? It's funny that the pandemic sure pushed us into some weird spots. I know that uh, when, when things first went dark and we were waiting for hockey to start up again, you know, you're stuck at home and you don't know what to do and the fridge is there and you start going to the fridge a little bit too often uh <laughs> by the time i went back to the bubble in the playoffs i went to put my suits back on because you don't need suits to hang around in the house right um and two-thirds of them didn't fit so one i got really fat and then uh i went in the other direction i had lost 40 pounds in the last oh, wow. half of uh uh, 2020. So, uh, I mean, it forced us into some, t- forced me personally into some tough spots and then to force me to get out of those tough spots. And as for the hockey part, I mean, it's just, it's so good to be back. I mean, I love my job. We're all, any of us who do this for a living are mm-hmm. beyond lucky to do it for a living. Uh, I'm never going to forget that as long as I hold this position and taking a little hiatus like we did just drives that point home. So to be back and talking hockey, watching hockey, doing stuff like this with you, it couldn't be better. It really couldn't be better. It's really, really good to have you on. I just wonder, Sean, I know here in the States and I'm in Columbus right now, they've got 20% capacity. So there was a little over 4,500 fans at the Panthers Blue Jackets game last night. Are we anywhere close to seeing fans in Canada as far as you can tell? No, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, one, yeah. we're not, uh, we're not as advanced in, in getting people uh, vaccinated as they, as they are in the States. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I used to do news. So I, I, I stay in touch with a lot of my news buddies. And I mean, I know I see, it seems to be at the provincial level in Manitoba is where everything mm-hmm. differs. So you can only kind of really go by what your, uh, what your pro- province is doing but uh i mean ideas of, that i thought that they'd be potentially put rolling out like things like vaccine passports so that you've got your vaccine you've got proof that you you've d- done it and you can get out and start going to places um i'm i'm not hearing of that happening in these areas so uh i mean maybe by playoffs but even then when i when i hear and, and by no means am i an authority on this uh mm. it's just the people that i talk to in the news side of things, the people who cover that beat tell me not to be hopeful about having fans back in the stands in this uh, in this season. Okay, well, very interesting stuff. But hey, we like you said, well, at least we get to talk about hockey, and that's that's good for everybody, and especially a team that you're covering in the Jets, who they're doing pretty well for themselves in this Northern Division. They had a great win last night, four to three over the Toronto Maple Leafs. It just makes us wonder from the outside, Sean, are we talking about a situation where? Maybe if the rest of the season goes right, you know, they had that performance against a really good team in the Leafs. Could they possibly overtake the Leafs in your mind at all? Oh, I, I think it's, I think it's more than possible. I, I think, and then they have two more games against them right now. And if they're able to, to perform and steal some games, I mean, the one thing about this is even if they win the next game and then go and lose the next one against the Leafs, they're chasing them. Right. So if you only gain two points on them in three games, that's why it's it's difficult to to, to gain gra- to pick up ground, but we're seeing the Leafs walk into their first bit of a mini slump so far this season. They lose three mm-hmm. games in a row. I don't believe they lost two games in a row before they lost two games in a row to Vancouver coming in against uh, the Winnipeg Jets. But that is one of the hallmarks and the strengths of this Winnipeg Jets team is they don't slump. Now, I'm not saying it's not going to happen. It happens to every team, but they've only lost back-to-back games once this year. And in one of those games, they earned a point. This is a team that bounces back from really tough losses. And you're talking about that win that they had against the Toronto Maple Leafs. Well, they get absolutely run out of the rink the night before or not the game before against the Montreal Canadiens. And it's at the point now where covering this team, you don't, really need to ask them how they're going to respond or if you think they're ready or any of those things this is a team that comes out like clockwork after a loss and you see them have their best effort 
Mm-hmm. And the, the, the deal is that when this team has its best effort, there's not a lot of teams in this division who seem to be able to beat them. Now that game against the Leafs, it's one of those games where it looks like the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, deserve a better fate, but that's the scary thing about this Winnipeg Jets team. They lose, mm-hmm. or sorry, they win a lot of games that on the outside, if you take a look at the shot count, if you take a look at the, you know, the statistics and the metrics, there's a lot of games that looks like they should lose and they still win those games. And that's because this is a veteran team that knows how to get the right performances at the right times and they do it consistently. Mm-hmm. That is a scary thing for sure. And I think a lot of people, especially this year, Sean, you know, we all have our own divisions that we're following. The North's doing their thing. You guys are doing your thing. I know here in the Central, we're doing our thing. It's like everybody's in their own little pod, in a sense, paying attention to their division. So we're really not seeing a lot of what goes on in some of the other divisions. But when you look at it from an overall perspective, you know, Connor McDavid, Austin Matthews, those are the players that get the attention guy that I think deserves a lot more attention is Mark Shifley. Can you just talk to everybody about how far he's come along and maybe even some of the next steps he's taken in his game? Because, you know, from my untrained eye, he's performed really well this year. I mean, it's interesting that, that idea of people not getting, uh, I mean, Blake Wheeler talked about it earlier in the season saying that he didn't think that Mark Shifley gets the recognition that he deserves. And I mean, we have, uh, we have these conversations. Uh, we do a local podcast here. And one of the mm-hmm. questions that we ask when we have national personalities come in is, would you have Mark Shifley on your team Canada? And it's, Strange enough, considering where he is, you know, top five in the league in scoring, never mm-hmm. mind top five in Can- Canadians in scoring. This is in the league, every all the best players in the world. And so many people have him right on the bubble. Chris Johnston, uh, our, one of our insiders at Sportsnet, put yep. his team together and had Mark Shifley as that 13th forward. Um, there is this feeling that he maybe doesn't get the recognition he deserves. It was interesting because coming into the season, his head coach, who's you know the biggest Mark Shifley booster you'll find other than maybe his parents and maybe even more so, Um, but he had said he thought this would be an interesting year with the division. You talked about those big names players, the Austin Matthews, the Connor McDavid's, the Leon Dreisaitl's and, and, uh, Paul Maurice had talked about how he fully expected this year, Mark Shifley to use this North division format as a way to elbow himself into the conversation with those best players uh, in that division, which puts him amongst the best players in the game. Uh, and I think, I think we're seeing a lot of that. Now, I, I'll always say this. One of the things that, that maybe hurts Mark Shifley's cause is that wherever Mark Shifley goes, there goes Blake Wheeler. And Blake Wheeler has been one of the best setup men in the game for a number of years. Mm. Uh, he's moving into his mid-30s. He may not be as impactful not far off but may not be as impactful as he was a few years ago but Mm -hmm. what we haven't seen from mark shifley is a guy who has had to single-handedly drag along you know maybe line mates who shouldn't be on a top line the way that we've seen from some other star players around the league um so i mean that may be one thing that hurts him is that he's always got that guy on his side who at times has been and for the most part in the last couple years has been the better player on those two lines so emerging from that shadow would be one of the reasons that you don't hear as much about Mark Shifley, because a lot of times we've been talking about this team and he's not the best player on this team. So mm-hmm. clearly at this stage, uh, Nick Ehlers has given him a run for his money, but Mark Shifley is clearly the best Winnipeg jet out there now. And as he's stepped out, he's, I think not quite stepped out of the shadow of those places, those players. I don't know if you can step out of the shadow of a player like Connor McDavid. He's just too, too good. But mm-hmm. Mark Shifley is doing a good spot, good job of doing exactly what his coach said, elbowing his way into the conversation amongst the best high-end players in this division. Mm-hmm. Sean Reynolds from Sportsnet joining us here on the Hockey Writers Live, talking all things Winnipeg Jets. And can't talk about the, the Jets without talking about a huge trade that happened recently with Patrick Laine and Pierre-Luc Dubois. So from the Jets' perspective, you know, Dubois did miss a couple games with injury, but it seems like that... He's transitioning in fairly well, had scored a couple of big goals here recently. Just how has he transitioned in and just how much of a boost does he ultimately give them? Because just down the middle, not many teams that are better off than the Jets when it comes to center ice anymore. 
Yeah, you you see uh, flashes of uh, Pierre Luc Dubois. Uh, uh, he's a, he's a player that may not have stood out the most to me when I'd g- gone and covered Columbus games. I mean, he's a great player. What he did in the playoffs last year against the Toronto Maple Leafs was really really impressive. But you'll see those flashes. Uh, we're up in the press box and we're watching. And in almost every scenario, when he goes in for a puck battle along the boards, and you'll have seen this, and you'll know exactly where I'm going with this. But he's just stronger than everybody else. So he walks in and he just says excuse me i'm stronger than you pushes the guy out of the way with very little effort scoops the puck up and is able to control that puck his board work is absolutely phenomenal Phenomenal. his his first couple games uh he looked like a player who'd been in quarantine and needed you know some time to get his skates underneath him then he ran into the injury he comes out of that you want to get it give him a boost well who did we talk about before mark shifley and blake wheeler put him on line with those two guys and i don't care who you are it could be you or i and we're gonna look pretty (laughs) we're gonna look like the best versions of ourselves if you put us on a line with those two players and I thought it was a smart move by Paul Maurice to do that to get him feeling one like he's part of the team two uh to kind of realize the opportunity that comes with playing with the Winnipeg Jets is that you have you're you're surrounded by all these great players now he he spent some time on that line scored some big goals like you said he's now moved down in the 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 experiment of putting him at center and i shouldn't say experiment because i think that's the long-term plan but the beginning of the long-term plan is unroll unrolling he's been put in that spot he's got kyle connor on one wing nick ehlers on the other wing kyle connor doesn't know how to play a season without putting up 30 goals and nick ehlers is threatening that bar every single year so he's got everything he needs um i don't think that that line has caught well they haven't caught fire yet i don't think we've seen what they're capable of. I think he's supposed to be the defensive presence on there that allows those guys to vacate the zone and play with speed. Um, they've had, they scored an overtime winner as a line uh, against Montreal two games ago. So they're mm-hmm. showing some progress. I haven't seen yet though, that, that breakout uh, performance that has me entirely convinced uh and i think the one thing is you're always going to compare those players there's always going to be a comparison between pierre luc dubois and patrick line and what i can say definitely from what i've seen so far is patrick line is the more wow player of those two no doubt about it he's right. the guy who pops he's the guy who's capable of doing some special things that leave your jaw dropping at all times pierre luc dubois looks like he's he's very likely going to be the more com- complete player both types of players can be used uh, on, on teams to make them successful. But back to a point I'd made earlier, Pierre-Luc Dubois is going to walk onto a roster where he's going to play as a center. And for the next, as long as he stays with the Winnipeg Jets, especially in the short term, he's going to have really, really good players playing on his wing, which should mean that, you know, on some nights he's going to show up and he's going to dominate and he's going to be the difference maker in a game and he's going to get three points. And some nights he may be entirely off and he's still going to get three points because he's just on a, uh, on a lineup that has so many weapons Uh, and and Mm -hmm. that, that can build confidence. And that I think goes a long way to bring out the best in, in players. And that's why you'll see a lot of times Winnipeg Jets players who come to the Winnipeg Jets, who see the best versions of those players and mm-hmm. sometimes when they leave, you see that those players get exposed a little bit at times. Yeah, and you know, speaking of it from a Columbus perspective, just look back to the bubble and that hat trick that he had against the Toronto Maple Leafs. He has that ability, and I don't think Jets fans have entirely seen it yet. It's obviously very early, but he can take over a game when he wants to. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the strength. You, He's got skill, too. I mean, he... he I think that's one of the underrated parts of his game. Then when he wants to, he can be a really good passer and he can finish. And I think that that's what makes things really exciting for him. And once he gets a little bit more comfortable and into the system, I certainly do think the best is yet to come for Pierre-Luc Dubois with the Winnipeg Jets. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens now. Sean, well, and, and before you move on to your yeah. point, he has all those tools. We've seen the the finish. He's already got two overtime goals. But he's smart. The, the, mm-hmm. the first overtime goal that he had, he was playing uh, the Vancouver Canucks. It's overtime. And Brock Besser is checking him in. He's going in one-on-one. And he looks over and, and looks like he's making eye contact with the Winnipeg Jet player, uh, like he's setting up to make a pass. And Brock Besser looks off to see what 
lane he has to cover because clearly <laughs> Pierre-Luc Dubois is communicating with another player. And as he looks, well, there was no one there. It was just, it was Pierre-Luc Dubois faking him out, bluffing, looking him off. And as soon as he looked away, he puts on the burners, skates past him in that moment's hesitation that he creates. And like you said, has the finish to, to bury that play. Uh, like, this is a young man. This is a young man who we're still seeing scratching the surface of his capabilities. But like you'd said, we've got all this raw talent involved in that. We've got these smarts that we see uh, that now comes the job, which I think, uh, I mean, it, it was similar with Blake Wheeler when he showed up in Winnipeg. It was Paul Maurice's job to get him to do what he did at a mm -hmm. high level and do it all the time. Well, that's the next thing with Pierre-Luc Dubois. Yeah, absolutely right, Sean. So a couple more questions for you here. Um, I know that one of the questions about the Jets coming into the season was just the overall defense. You know, Dustin Bufflin no longer there. A lot of people pointed at that as, okay, how is this going to work out? They've been fine. I mean, you look at it from an overall team perspective, they've done really fine. And one guy in particular, because I know I'm playing against him in fantasy this week, mm -hmm. Neil Pionk, three assists last night in the Leafs game, but it seems like that he's really taken that next step. What is it about him that he's been able to do that? And then what has the defense been able to do as an overall whole to kind of answer some of the questions that fans may have had about them? Okay, I'll try and remember the second half of that question. Uh, but, but Pionk, I mean, he's just so sharp. I mean, if someone's laying a big hit out on the ice coming off the back end, it's typically mm -hmm. not Derek Forbort or Nathan Beaulieu. It's Neil Pionk. So small Neil Pionk is the guy, and he can throw these hits and he catches guys out of nowhere and and what you're seeing again is that hockey iq of like when a guy is looking at you and then looks down at the puck and the moment he looks is when you make your move yeah. he lives in those areas where he's able to take advantage of other players and and just really be able to see those slight little spots in the game where you can activate and you saw it if you see the highlights against that uh, against the toronto maple leafs in that last game there's a clearing pass that they throw out and the guy waiting for the puck it never gets to him because neil pionk sees the play developing even though it's completely on the other end of the ice jumps the route picks up the pass heads in the other direction and all of a sudden the jets have all the momentum and that ends up being the the mason appleton goal but it all mm -hmm. starts on a great play by neil pionk and he does that time and time and time again and it's really interesting because i believe he's mm -hmm. sitting he's fourth or fifth in in uh defenseman scoring in the nhl and we talked wow. with him today and I'd, uh, I'd had, uh, I'd asked him if two years ago, did he see himself being a player that had that kind of, that, that had the ability to be up amongst the top five defensemen in the league in scoring. And he'd said, you know, ever since he got to the Jets, just his confidence has been building and building and building. And this, I think, is getting back to the point I made about Pierre-Luc Dubois, about mm -hmm. Jets getting the best versions of players who come to their team. I asked Paul Maurice about it and what he saw. And he'd said, you know what it is, is a guy like Neil Pionk comes in and he, he makes that nice pass to a Nick Ehlers or a Blake Wheeler or a Kyle Connor. And then mm -hmm. that player takes it and does something with it and does something special with it. But when you set up that guy who gets the puck and then goes in and scores, it builds your confidence, right? Yep. And so what yep. we're seeing is when, when Neil Pionk tries something and is able to get a puck to another player on a Winnipeg Jets extremely deep roster, he's getting it to a player who's able to do something special with it. And when they do, your, your name starts showing up in the score sheet more and more often and your confidence grows and you start to change the way that you think about yourself. And that's what we've seen from him and credit to him. I'm not just saying he showed up on the Jets roster and and they make him a better player. He's mm -hmm. pushed and he's got better. He's fit in. He's improved. He's figured out other guys and he's making other guys on that team better. Uh, so he has been an absolute steal in that trade for Jacob Truba. Never mm -hmm. mind the fact that Vili Hainala, who may end up being the best player out of all of them, is the draft pick that the Jets pick up with that. Mm -hmm. uh, your second part of the question when it comes to the defense, what we're seeing here is a really phenomenal team effort and a system that you really got to give the Winnipeg Jets head coach and their coaches credit for. The mm -hmm. Jets were 
terrible on giving up high danger chances last season. The only reason they weren't an absolute washout was because Connor Hellebuck was phenomenal and wins the Vezina trophy. Right. They needed to clean that up. They said they were going to clean it up. They decided how they were going to clean it up is by sacrificing offense and run and gun style offense and playing more team defense and just grinding out your offense from there. So what I would say uh, that the defense are doing really well with the Winnipeg Jets is mm -hmm. what the offense are doing really well. They're playing within the system. They're playing uh, with a mind of, of limiting chances and catching teams making mistakes as they cheat to try and uh, penetrate the Jets' defense and then jumping on those mistakes and scoring the other direction. The team has really bought into it. It seems to be working. Uh, they're activating in 2018 when the Jets were the best version of, of themselves and looked to be potentially winning the Stanley Cup that year. Uh, the defense just didn't let you get into their zone. They activated, they tried to hit mm -hmm. you at the line because they knew that there would be a forward coming back to get the puck. They don't have the big horses they had back then, the Tyler Myers, the Dustin Bufflins, the Trubas, but they have players who are confident that they can sh show up, interrupt the other team's momentum and have faith that their forwards will be the first ones back to pick up that puck when they do that. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's it's been a masterpiece for the Jets so far this season. And you said it earlier too, somebody that I think does deserve a lot of credit. It's a perfect segue into the next question is head coach Paul Maurice. I know here in Columbus, Tortorella has talked all the time about how he's had to adjust his approach to the current team he has. And I just wonder, is that something that you've seen out of Paul Maurice this year? You mentioned that they're kind of transition cleaning up their own end. Just talk about the job that he's done and specifically how he's been able to adjust to you know the, the team that they have. I mean, I think, you know, what I was just talking about is a good example of what they've had to do, the X's and O's of what they've had to do to compete. If you take a look at their defense, it's it's like, let's be honest, it's not a championship level defense. I think they have uh, only five goals from the point uh, so far this season. Um, it's, it's not, uh, they probably need to address it before the trade deadline. If they want to take advantage of a season, which I mean, I think the massive thing for the Winnipeg jets is there's a chance they don't have to, they definitely don't have to play or they will only have to play of at the most one of the St. Louis blues or the Colorado avalanche or the Vegas golden Knights that in there coming out of the West is an absolute victory that you don't have to face two of those teams on your way to a Stanley cup final. Yep. Uh, so that, but the, the thing that I think Paul Maurice has done best is the mental preparation of this team. And I go back to what I'd said about this team, not losing two games in a row. This is a focused team. And you, the one thing that I will say is you will hear messages from player after player after player that they'll come out and you'll see it. It's, it's a mantra that they speak. You know, you don't want to lose two games in a row. They say that time and time again in press conferences and you don't need to ask them about it. They submit that in information. That's a mantra of theirs. And when you hear a mantra or themes that come up time and time again, from player to player to player, that's a coach whose message has reached his team. Uh, mm. The other part that I think he's done really well is this is a deep team, very deep up front. Um, and sometimes when you've got very deep teams, players can get lost. I always go back to this example time and time again. I think it's the 2003 Colorado Avalanche. It's the year they have this amazing team and then they go pick up Paul Correa and Timu Solani and you're thinking these guys are winning the cup this year and Solani and uh, Correa have a terrible year because there's just not enough ice time to go around for all those stars. No. What Paul Maurice has done is he's crafted an identity and a role for every single mm. player in his top 12 and he's got every single one of those players to buy into that. And that's why you're seeing the Winnipeg Jets beat the Toronto Maple Leafs with goals from Mason Appleton and Andrew Kopp. And that's why you're seeing Matthew Perot scoring goals in multiple games back to back. Uh, for, you're seeing Matthew Perot do that from the fourth line. You're seeing Andrew Kopp have one of the best years he's had before. You saw a, a scoring touch from Adam Lowry that you haven't really seen before. And more importantly, in that top six, you've got players like 
Nick Ehlers and Kyle Connor, uh, Mark Shifley to a degree who they're, they haven't had that solid lineup that's allowed them to rack up the points. Uh, I've said this, they've been juggling the lines like crazy. And I think Kyle Connor has suffered goal wise from it, but those players are okay with their momentum being stalled as Paul Maurice plays with different combinations because he wants this team to be ready for anything. And he wants to be able to take any three players in that top six and throw them out and have them succeed come playoff time. That's buy it because a lot of those players who like to score goals, who like to put up points when they see that's being messed with, they don't like it. Uh, mm-hmm. You do not hear Winnipeg Jets players complain about it from the first line center to the seventh defenseman on this team guys know their roles and they're executing those roles without complaint. Mm. Sean Reynolds from Sportsnet, who covers Winnipeg Jets joining us. We got one more question for you, Sean, and it's just about the trade deadline approach. And I mentioned at the beginning, only 32 days until the trade deadline kind of sneaking here. We mentioned the defense a little bit. Is that maybe where they try to focus on improving? I know, Obviously, got the quarantine. Have to wait 14 days for a team. Then, like what Pierre Luc Dubois went through. But what needs do you see for this team? That um, and do you feel like that they could try to go for it all this year? Personally, I think they have to go for it all this year. I think the North Division and this setup. The, back to the point that I made about them not having to play. You know, the St. Louis's and. Colorado's and the Vegas is or yep. only one of those teams. I don't think you find an easier path to the Stanley cup final this year ever as you will. If you're the Winnipeg jets right now, especially mm-hmm. if you're looking at going back to the central division next season. So uh, I think you have to approach this as your opportunity. I think that you've got the depth up front that suggests that, that you've, got enough there to compete with almost any team in the league. You've got a Vesna caliber goaltender who, while he hasn't been entirely at that level, he's shown this season showed it in the last game against the Toronto Maple Leafs that he can still steal games when they are big games, which he's mm-hmm. done. So you've got that squared away. You've got a defensive system that seems to be working. The last thing you want to do is have your opportunity go. And then at some point be exposed because your defense uh, gets leaned on and ground down uh, and, and isn't able to hang with the upper echelon talent that you'll meet on the way to the Stanley Cup final. So I do think that you need to shore that up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think the one thing that's at play here with a lot of different teams is the expansion draft. Right now, the Jets are set up perfectly to not really lose a player of massive significance uh, the way that they're set up. If they go out and get a Matthias Ekholm, which I think would be a perfect fit for their defense. um, They probably, they probably have to give up big assets to get that. And then they probably lose Dylan DeMello on the back end because now they've got four guys that they need to protect. Um, As a GM, I I think uh, you, that's the risk that you have to make. And that's the loss you have to be okay with. I, it's a different sport, but I go back and I look at the Toronto Raptors and when they picked up Kawhi Leonard, I thought to myself, well, this is all or nothing. If they don't win the championship, this is a huge mistake, but they did win the championship. Right. And it would have been, I, I to this day, I say it, it would have been a massive mistake if they didn't win that championship. But once you've got a championship banner, hanging in those rafters. That's all that matters. And if you have a season where you think that you are capable of doing it, I think you have to put everything, you you can't leave any stone unturned in creating the roster that you know you need to get there. Well, fans, the excitement in Winnipeg is absolutely real. We can't wait to play it out. Sean, make sure you guys follow, fans follow him at SN Sean Reynolds for all your Jets needs. Thank you very much for the time today. We really appreciate your insight. Anytime, Mark. It's always great talking with you. Absolutely. And fans, stay tuned for part two. We're going to continue our Winnipeg Jets discussion with our panel coming up next. Well, hello, fans. Welcome back to part two of the Hockey Writers Live. And in case you missed part one, I had a wonderful interview with Sportsnet Sean Reynolds, who covers the Winnipeg Jets about as good as anybody out there in the industry. Just very knowledgeable, lots of good stories. Make sure you're definitely following him. But let's continue on with our Jets coverage here. We have now our panel for you. We're going to continue talking about, you know, what is making them click? You know, it seems like that they're a legitimate threat all of a sudden. We need to get to the bottom of 
how they've been able to get to this point. So to help us out, we're going to introduce our panel to you. We have Josh Kim. Hello, Josh. Welcome to the program. Hey, Mark. Great to be back. Love talking Jets and hockey in general. So thanks for having me. Um, I definitely appreciate you jumping on. Isaiah Wagner up in Manitoba joining us in. Hello, Isaiah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. And, and quick football notes. I know we have a lot of football fans that come on that Adam Thielen jersey. Very solid choice back there. Nice. Uh, Keith Thielen and Jefferson. Oh, there you go. Oh, you got both of them. Very good. Got both of them. Big Vikings fan. So. Big Vikings fan. And we have the old Professor Jim Parsons joining us. It's always great to have him because you can talk about multiple teams with us. Hello, Jim. Thank you, Mark. Good to be here. Appreciate it all having you here. So let's just jump right into the Winnipeg Jets experience, especially last night. That game, they end up beating the Toronto Maple Leafs 4-3. to three. Neil Pionk had three assists. That definitely stood out. But it just seems like that we get a complete team effort from the Jets you know, kind of night in and night out almost. They haven't really slumped that much. So that's kind of where we're going to start with this. So, Josh, what is going on with the Jets? So I guess in your mind, why are they so good? And – do you feel like that they're competitive enough that they could actually overtake the Leafs um, by the end of the season? Well, Mark, that's a great question. And, and to me, just watching both of them play on a night-in, night-out basis, I think both teams are quite similar in their structure and their roster structure. I think that Pierre-Luc Dubois acquisition was a game-changer for them. I mean, we already knew before the whole line-A saga went down and that this team was really winger-heavy. You had Nick Ehlers, who was already breaking out. You had Kyle Connor, who was already a proven offensive threat. So, you know, the trade for the trade to ship Line to Columbus, it wasn't so much a, a crazy news break because the Jets were already so heavy on the wing. So now mm-hmm. bringing in a center in Pierre Luc Dubois, that is a game changer because that was where they were really lacking the last couple of seasons. We saw Paul Stasny get acquired a couple of years ago as a rental just to solidify the top six at the center position. So now you bring him back in the offseason, you add Dubois, and here you have a great team now with who's already got a great strength on the wing, complemented by a great center core. And now you see the luxury of moving Paul Stasny to the top line to facilitate Mark Scheifele and Blake Wheeler. That move has paid off already, has paid plenty of dividends for this team. And Pierre-Luc Dubois settling quite nicely on that second line where he was projected to be alongside two potent offensive talents. Kyle Connor was having another great year. Nick Ehlers was having an even better year, which I don't think a lot of people expected, but he still is posting those numbers and producing offensively. So, you know, the qu- like that that aspect of things definitely makes them a great team, a great, a really fun team to watch as well, and a really all-around solid uh, team complete a complete team in general now to challenge the Leafs it's hard to predict where they're going to be because their roster structure is is really tight I think what this is going to boil down to is who's going to step up on the blue line and which goalie is going to come out on top in the end so last night we saw Connor Hellebuck really stand on his head all throughout that third period especially well throughout the game really but it was accented in that third period because the Leafs were were out shooting them at, at some point nine to two in that third period and then you have the blue line where the Leafs made a bunch of additions on the blue line who have caught, who have really fit into the system nicely and really bought into what this team is about. So moving forward, I think for me, the storylines, because the forward structure is so similar, I think this, the real storyline is going to be between the pipes and on the blue line, because that's both teams, probably their biggest question at this point. Isaiah, what stood out to you about the Jets so far? And then do you feel like that they can overtake the Leafs given where they're currently at? Yeah, to me, to prove on a Josh's point there, they have the ability to run all four lines. Um, first mm-hmm. line, even putting Stasny on the wing, just the flexibility of him. If they want to put Dubois up on the wing, uh, Stasny on the wing, they have so much flexibility to play with a player like Mark Shifley, who's proven to be a superstar, uh, great mm-hmm. leader, and Blake Wheeler. Um, just, just, the, just the ability to run all four lines um, – it just it helps them out so much. You put a th- you put a guy like Lowry, Cop, and Appleton against another team's top line. Not many teams can put their third line against another team's top line, which allows the the other matchups, the top two lines, to maybe one of them go against the other team's third line, and it helps them uh, produce offensively. On the blue line, the Jets. Um, it's always been a question mark mm-hmm. since the loss of Bufflin, Truba, Myers, and Sherratt. Uh, it was going to be a question mark going into this year. I think Derek Forbert has stepped up on a one year around $1 million deal. I believe that's a, that's a great deal. And he's played well with Neil Pionk. Neil Pionk has been great this year um, on his contract year. He's uh, he's proven that he could be a top two defenseman of um, him and Morrissey probably don't pair the best together, but if Morrison was not on the team, Pionk would definitely be the number one guy there. And uh, to take over the Leafs, I don't know. He's very interesting question. They're five points up, I believe, with the Jets have 
uh, two games behind the Leafs, I believe. Um, obviously, it's possible. Uh, I don't see them finishing first in the North. I mean, the Leafs have lost three in a row, but if you look at the roster, they have Matthews, Marner, Tavares, very similar to the Jets in offensive talent. Um, I think they'll turn it around. It will be close, but I, I think I see the Jets finishing second in, in that division and then having a great matchup with either hopefully the Oilers or the Canadians in the first round. Mm. And Jim, give you the final say on your early impressions of the season and if they could possibly overtake Toronto. Well, I'm inclined to say what they said because jo both Josh and Isaiah have really uh, wrapped it up nicely. Uh, I've been surprised at the Jets. And, and as Isaiah suggested, to me, their defense just looks a suspect. But Pionk has been amazing, <laughs> actually. Mm -hmm. Where did he come from? I don't think anyone... I mean, this undrafted player from Duluth, uh, where'd he come from? Uh, he, he just really has stepped up. And when you look at him, that trade for Truba and, and Bianca, it just, it just strikes me that the Jets really are now smiling. Uh, and But that he's the game changer. You know what you're going to get with their goalie. Halibut is is good and he's steady. And every once in a while, he uh, has a goofy game. But mostly he is really, really a strong goalie. So you know what you're going to get there. Nobody can argue that the forwards of the Jets are in the top tier of the NHL. But it's the de defense that really has made the difference to me. And in fact, their backup goalie has played quite well. It strikes mm -hmm. me. So that's, uh, that's been an, an addition. And so I, I'm, I'm surprised at the Jets. To the second question, are they going to catch the Leafs? I don't think so. Uh, but uh, that said, I'm constantly surprised. And uh, I do think uh, Maurice is a very smart coach. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. I think he really gets the best out of the guys. And he really sticks up for his players. It has to be a fun place to play if you're a player because Maurice really goes out of his way to, uh, to support and edify, build up his team. So I think that makes a huge difference as well. For sure. Well said there, um, Jim. So another guy I want to talk to the three of you about is somebody that I definitely think is underrated. Like you think about some of the best players out there, the Connor McDavid's of the world, the Austin Matthews of the world, the Leon Dreisaitl's of the world. I think we need to be talking about Mark Scheifele more just because everything that he's been doing, one of the top scorers overall, on the bubble of Team Canada when trying to constitute the roster for the Olympics. But here in the States, I don't think he gets enough attention. So Isaiah, just what is it about Shifley that makes him so good? And do you feel like that he's become an even more complete player this year um, in your mind? Yeah, I mean, since being drafted in 2011, Shifley has been my favorite Jets player for sure. Um, I'm assuming he's a, he's a fan favorite. Everyone loves him. Offensive talent is obviously there. He can drive the play. He makes every player on his line better, whether it's Dubois came on the wing and had three, uh, whatever, five points in two games. Mm -hmm. Stasny went, go, has gone on his wing. Um, he's put up points. Obviously, Blake Wheeler's over there, but I feel like Mark Schleife is the real driver of that line. Uh, he's a leadership. He's, he's clearly a leader. He wears assistant captain. Um, and he's always one of the most emotional players on the ice. You see videos after the play, and he's always – talking to the guys he's talking to the refs he's getting he's always he's very engaged in the game and he's like he's a hockey nut he loves that analytics kind of stuff so a guy like that who's it means he's smart um i mean he's just he's just a great all-around player uh the only issue that i have with shifley is 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 his face-off percentage i mean a lot of players have that uh for i think he's a 43 percent or 44 percent kind of guy this year but that's, that's the beauty of having a team like the Jets. I mean, you have Stasny on your line. He can jump in and take some of the important draws. And and Shifley, I think he's, I mean, I might be a little biased, but I think he's a lock for Team Canada in 2022. Mm. Just because he's, he's he's proven to be to be one of the top players in the league. The because he's, for sure. oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Jim, I just wonder too about, um, you know, he's been playing with Blake Wheeler all these years. And I think, is it fair to say that maybe part of the reason that Shifley doesn't get the love is because he's played with one of the premier playmakers in all the, in all of hockey in Blake Wheeler, or has he truly stepped up on his own in your mind? I don't know the answer to that question, Mark. Uh, what I, I do know is that he's uh, 
he's a really good player. <laughs> and uh, I mean, he was a point of game player, I think, in 2018, 2019. I think he had 84 points or something in 82 games. But when you look at his thing, I think he has 34 points in 25 games or something. That's really good. And not only that, uh, to he seems like a good guy. I People make fun of me on the hockey writers when I talk on these panels because I love everybody, right? I really, I really like all the players and I really like this guy. And I really, he came on my radar when he was injured in the postseason last year. And instead of being pissy about it, he just said, you know, my parents taught me not to be angry at stuff and sort of accept it as it was. And I thought, that is a good, I like that sort of ethos that he carries with him. And <clears throat> to me, that makes a huge difference because he really accepts things. He's got his head screwed on straight. I think that helps him. Like if, when they get beat 7-1 by the Canadians, yeah, you know, it's like Thornton in, in Toronto. Ah, there's another day. We'll come back and we'll do well. And that really matters, I think, if you're going to keep uh, over this long this show, I say long, but shortened and compressed season, you got to have your head screwed on, right? Or else you're going to really get down. <clears throat> and I don't think he's inclined to get down. So I think that makes him a good leader as well as a great player. And I really do think he's underrated, as you say, because you really, you, when you read about the Jets, you get a lot of goalie stuff and you really, he really doesn't pop up a lot and you have to go searching stuff about him so something's happening that he i think you're right he doesn't get the love that i think he deserves but i think he's a fantastic player absolutely right josh give you the final word on mark shifley yeah just to elaborate on isaiah's point there are really two jarring examples that that show that mark shifley is that leader and that gel that holds the winnipeg's top line together you look at his role in the power play it's a lot it's you know just watching Toronto so much it's quite similar to Mitch Marner and his role except it's from the opposite side of the ice you know the the guy that's always feeding Blake Wheeler at the goal line threading shots through to the net with Paul Stasny screening or going cross seam to Kyle Connor on the other side it's, it's always starts with Mark Scheifele and the play always goes through him and whatever setup the Jets have with the man advantage it really starts with Mark Scheifele with the puck so that's one example and the second example uh, Jim just touched on this you know, when the Jets, when Shifley went down in the bubble last year with that horrific injury that thankfully wasn't as bad as people feared, you know, it, it's one way, it's one thing to say that the Jets fell apart because their top line center got injured, but it's another thing to to say the Jets fell apart because Mark Shifley was not in the locker room and wasn't with the team. So, you know, mm-hmm. there those are two main examples to me that really show how much this guy means to Winnipeg and how much success is leveled on his shoulders because of the role that he plays on the team. And, you know, we don't really see too many players, you know, like that around in the league. You mentioned Austin Matthews in the preamble there, Mark. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when he went down, the Leafs filled the gap and, and managed to, to, to survive pretty much life without him. Now, that's not saying Matthews is, is any worse than Shifley is, but I don't think it, it, you'd be hard, it'd be tough to come up with a list of players that, that have more of an impact on their, on their team's success than Mark Shifley just because of the role that he plays and just because of how much flows through him on a night in and night out basis. And fans, in case you're just tuning in, this is the Hockey Writers Live. We're talking with our Winnipeg Jets panel of Josh Kim, Isaiah Wagner, and Jim Parsons. Make sure you don't miss any of these interviews whatsoever, whether it be earlier with Sean Reynolds or with our panels here. Make sure you hit that um, subscribe button out there on YouTube and on Facebook as well. Make sure you like these videos and you will not miss a thing. So, Jim, we're going to go back to you here. I know you guys brought him up earlier, but Paul Maurice, I think, doesn't get enough credit as a coach, especially for the job that he's done this year. I feel like he's had to make several adjustments, especially with the approach that they've had on defense. Just talk about the job that he's done. Just how much credit does he deserve for the kind of year they're having so far? I think he deserves a lot of credit, actually. I, I think he's an amazingly good coach. Uh, and uh, and there are a couple of things I like. From uh, I'm an old guy, right? I'm in my mid-70s, and that matters to me because I've been around a lot and I have a good sense when I was an academic leadership was one of the areas of my research. He really is a good leader in every way that my research suggested good leaders act. He really is a good leader. He takes it on himself when, uh, when the team's going out, he doesn't point fingers at his players. In fact, he goes out of his way. I think it was Appleton uh, last year. He said, 
this guy really deserves to play. Or he, 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 when he talks to the media, he talks to the media like he has a relationship with the media. He's straight up with them. They ask him questions. He answers. There's no attitude. Uh, either way, there's no attitude. And every once in a while, he does a commercial on one of his guys. He said, watch this guy. He really deserves to play. He may not play, but or he said about uh, one of his defensive, maybe his blue or something, he was saying, you know, this guy comes on one-year contracts year after year after year. He fights. He's he's always risking his livelihood because he's he's sticking up for his guys. Watch him. I mean, he's going out of his way to pump up people. And mm-hmm. if, that, if my experience suggests that makes a huge difference in the way players feel like they belong to a team that's bigger than themselves. They'll play for each other and they really will pull together as a team. And it really is a team that wins a Stanley Cup and not a bunch of individual players. And we say that in all pro sports. So I really think he deserves a, a lot of credit for where this team has gone. Mm-hmm. Josh, what about you and Paul Maurice? Yeah, uh, just to echo Jim's point, there he is a really you talk about mark shively being underrated i think paul maurice is a really underrated coach in that aspect i mean you just look at the situations that he's had to deal with over the years you know the whole patrick line i think just just because that's so fresh in everyone's memory but the thing that sticks out to me the most is that constant revolving door of defensemen that he has to deal with on a night in and night out basis i mean last year there were some i wrote about this and there were something like 13 to 16 different names all year that suited up on the blue line for Winnipeg. And it's kind of the same thing this year. You know, he's deployed Billy Hainola in a couple of games. He's used Logan Stanley in a couple of games and even Sammy Niku, which, you know, didn't really work out, but still he tried it still. And it's, it's stuff like that that really makes a coach's job tough because when you have so many players on, on the outside looking in, you want to find playing time for everybody and you want to find the best combination that works. And that takes a lot of experimentation that, and that takes a lot of effort and really, you know, we saw his bold side where, where he's just experimenting with pairings mid-game and pre-game. So just the the added challenge of having so many different names on the blue line to, to have to look at on a sheet and, and contemplate who you're plugging into the lineup nightly, that can be hard. And, and that is just really something that I think has impressed me the most because I don't think any coach has had to go through that level of adversity in terms of roster structure. And you, Jim, you, you, you talked about how you know, this team really gelled under Paul Maurice. And I, I can't, I, I mean, I have to agree there because even this past year, he openly defended Blake Wheeler on live television because he was drawing so much criticism for defensive play. Our own, the hockey writer's own Declan Schroeder even wrote a piece about it. And even though I fully agreed with the concept and how Blake Wheeler was struggling defensively, we don't get to see really a coach come out that publicly and, pub- and defend their player to that extent that he did. So that was also an overly impressive thing for me. And and really you see a lot of the guys in Winnipeg right now, buy into the system and buy into their role. You know, Nate, you mentioned Nathan Beaulieu. He come, he's coming back on a one-year contract every single year, but he's still trying his hardest on the third pairing. And he's, even though it's in a very limited role, he's still, you know, trying his very best to really make an impact on the team. And another example, this time up front is Matthew pro who was on the second line, just like three or four years ago. And now he's kind of faded into that veteran presence and a depth scoring role, but he's also bought into the system. And that's exactly why he's still around on the team. So, you know, it takes a very specific coach to, to keep players for a long time and really use them in effective situations. But Paul Maurice is definitely one of those coaches that has done a fantastic job. And he's had the, the, the added challenge of having multiple names, circle around on a nightly basis in and around the team so just all in all a really good coach a really good players coach and i think you know it, the success speaks for itself and winnipeg and the players in in winnipeg definitely like playing under him absolutely isaiah give you the final word on paul maurice yeah you guys summed it up great points by both of you um i haven't really had a huge problem with maurice since he started coaching the jets i mean i think he takes a lot of heat on twitter all the time from jets fans from other guys and uh, like other fans in the league saying, I think his biggest decision uh, this year where people were pretty upset was the putting in of Nate Thompson in the lineup and taking out Christian Vazelein and once Thompson mm-hmm. got uh, healthy. But I mean, Thompson went in, uh, the Jets go on a three game win streak and Thompson penalty killed. He scored the one of the game winning goals that in that three game win streak. I mean, he makes questionable lineup decisions every now and then, but he, he has a reason for it. He knows why he's doing it. He knows why he is doing it. I mean, every coach has a reason for something, right? I mean, he's been coaching for so long, so he must be doing something right. Uh, the Jets have been a, a great team this year. Um, like Josh said, he, I, he stood up for Blake Wheeler. That's huge. Who, who wouldn't want to play for a coach that stands up 
that stands out for you openly to the media so everyone can see, but not just in the locker room. So, I mean, I have no complaints about a coach like that. If, if a team likes to play for you, um, if you're winning games, I mean, I have no problems with him. He's been doing – I think he's been a great coach for the Jets so far. Very good. So, two more questions for you guys um, here. So, Josh, we'll start with you on this one. And we got to talk about the defense because I think a lot of people came in this season wondering – how are they going to do things? Maybe it was the biggest question mark that they had, but overall they've played pretty well. Neil Pionk especially has really stood out at three assists in the game against the Leafs recently. So just what is it about Neil Pionk that he's been able to have a breakout like this? And then what has the team been able to do overall to be able to play solid defensively in your mind? Yeah, for sure. Neil, Neil Pionk is a, a very interesting case and, you know, I remember watching him back when he was a Ranger. And I think, you know, what really stood out to me when he was in New York was that he was constantly buried under a lot of different players. You remember Mark Stahl was ahead of him on the in the lineup. You remember Brady Shea was ahead of him in the lineup. So when you have an offensively minded defenseman wanting to get prime scoring chances and wanting to drive offensive chances in the transition game, but you don't put him in a position to, to succeed, obviously the production is not going to be there because he's lower on the depth chart. Now, this is a huge um, environment switch for him. You know, he's partnered with Derek Forbert, a very stay-at-home guy. He's on here, a you know, short-term deal here in Winnipeg, but is a relatively stay-at-home guy. And that has really allowed him to exploit his offensive ability. And I think this is what we were seeing. He was hinting at this in New York while he was there, but now in an environment where he's really put into the spotlight and really, you know, has the ability to just drive the play on a night in and night out basis. I think now we're seeing an increase in amount of production because he's been able to be put in an effective situation by Paul Maurice and just the personnel around him. Now, from a defensive standpoint, I haven't been overly impressed with the Jets defensively. However, I do like the fact that a lot of players have bought into the system. Derek mm -hmm. Forbert being a, a very uh, obvious case of that, because again, short term deal, and he's really stepped up his game and tried to do his hardest. To, well, it is, it helps that Winnipeg system suits his playing style perfectly because of his stay at home defensive ability. But you even look at Tucker Pullman who doesn't try to do too much and just tries to play a rugged physical game. Even him, mm -hmm. he has bought into the system playing on that top pairing with Josh Morrissey. Um, you know, so that I think buying into the system is a really key takeaway from all of this and that how players need to just understand the role that they have on the team and really just, you know, just stay within their own ability. Now, my main concern is on the bottom pair currently Dylan DeMello and Nathan Beaulieu. Both of them have been rather shaky. I know DeMello missed some time because uh, he he had a he had a baby and he was injured for the first part of the season. But both of them have been a little shaky. So, you know, there, there are pros and cons to having so many depth defensemen on your team. But, you know, one step forward is them stepping up their game and, and the Jets' defense looks absolutely unstoppable now. So you already have a top four that's very capable of playing a shutdown role against the other team's top units. And if you... The, the, um, the more the merrier when it comes to help on the blue line. So if Bolu and DeMello can really come into their own like they did last year where they were just a, that stable shut, that stable pair. I know DeMello was on the top unit with uh, Josh Morrissey for a stretch there, but even if they can come into their own and just be that stay-at-home defensive pair that Winnipeg needs, this that's another step in the right direction for this team in terms of come playoff time. I agree. And Isaiah, what about the defense and Neil Pionk for you? Yeah, Pionk. I mean, uh, I think Jets fans can finally say that they're they're happy with the return they got for Jacob Truba. You got Pionk there, and then you got the first round pick, which ended up being uh, finished uh, Billy Hinola, another defenseman who should be playing full time for the Jets next year. I mean, Pionk. He's smart, offensively talented, and uh, wicked shot. I'd I'd love to see him in maybe even the hardest shot contest in the uh, All Star game. I mean, some of the t some of the times he's taken a shot, it's been pretty hard. Um, but the one thing I've been impressed with this year is actually his physical play. He's been way more aggressive than he has any other year. And um, I personally, I love that. I think it's a great trait to have as a defenseman. Play with, Obviously, he plays in another physical guy, Derek Forbert. But mm -hmm. Pionk, he can transition the puck very well. Up the ice, back, um, back in their own end. Um, I like him a little bit more on the first power play than Josh Morrissey. But I mean, the first power play has been doing a little well, has been doing well and he He's definitely a good compliment on that second second unit. Only thing I'm curious about is, of Pionk is is what he's going to be asking for when his contracts due at the end of the season. I mean, I mean, is he going to be wanting the same as Josh Morrissey? Was it just north of six million? Is he going to want a little less? I'm. It's going to be. It's going to be interesting to see. Hmm. And Jimmy, get the final word on the defense and Pionk. 
Oh, I wish I didn't have the final word because Josh and Isaiah know way more about this than I do. Honestly, Pionk has been a, a surprise to me. I never watched him in New York until about three years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I watched the odd hockey game. I was a full-time academic and, and still teach. Uh, but I, I don't know his body of work. He totally was a surprise to me last year when he came on, uh, came on the team. So uh, these guys know way more about him than I do, but he is a surprise and he really can shoot the puck. So I mean, that, that he's, he's, he seems to be an amazing young fellow. Uh, where he came from, I sort of looked back at his career path and what a surprise. He wasn't even drafted. So interesting. And uh, somebody was smart to bring him uh, to the Jets. And I, I find him interesting. And honestly, I don't know his body of work all that well, not like these young fellows do. Mm. Still real good um, for him, especially that trade to get the return from Truba and to have him come out like this. And I'll make the funny point that I'm playing against him in fantasy this week. And so him piling on assists like that is not good for my well-being at all. But seriously good for him. And we'll see where things go with that. So Isaiah, we're going to start with you with the last question of the panel. And it's going to be the trade deadline. And I just wonder at this point, it seems like that the offensive pieces are there. We know Connor Hellbuck's going to do his thing. So maybe they lean defense if they do anything, but I guess one, do they have to do anything? And two, what do you think they try to do? I I think they do have to do something with the defense. I mean, you look at a Stanley Cup contender, uh, they mm-hmm. all have great defense. The Jets, if if they get into that realm of the Stanley Cup contender, they they need to they need to fix up their defense. Maybe a guy like Bolu comes out and or a guy like Pullman comes out and a guy like Ristolainen, Ekholm, um, Montour, guys like that. One of those guys can come in. That's what I think. That's exactly what the Jets need is a guy like that. Um, maybe not a guy, a guy like Montour. I believe his contract's due at the end of the season. But even a guy like Ristolainen or Matthias Ekholm from Buffalo and Nashville, they have one more year left after this, and that's huge yeah. on a trade piece. I mean, if a guy like Ristolainen wants out of Buffalo, I if I was shoveled day off, I'd be calling. I'd be calling Buffalo pretty quick because he's big defenseman. He could play top four minutes. He could be exactly what the Jets need. Could fit very well. I mean, like you said, the Jets have a great forward group. Um, at the start of the year, I was thinking maybe they could use a, a bottom six guy, maybe like a fourth liner, but Thompson, Perot, Lewis, they've all stepped up and, and proven that they can they can play nine minutes a game, eight, nine minutes a game and, uh, and do it effectively. Um, so maybe a guy like Ristolainen at home, I think he'd be a great fit to take out a guy maybe like Bolu, Poolman. And then next year you even got a guy like Hainola coming in, Samberg coming in. So they would they would definitely fit in well with Morrissey, Pionk, Ristolain and Arekholm, DeMello. That could be a that could end up being a p- pretty scary defense. Isaiah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yep, go ahead. I'm sorry about that. No, I was just saying uh guys like uh next year, Hainola and Samberg coming in could be a uh, Real nice fit with a guy like Ristolain and Ekholm, Morrissey, Pionk. That could end up being a really dangerous, uh, really dangerous defense core with a really very dangerous forward and goalie as well. So I think mm-hmm. this could be one of the Jets year, um, but they just need to improve one or two guys on the blue line. Jim, what do you say about the um, deadline approach? I, I heard an interesting thing, an interesting uh, interview with Maurice a few days ago. Uh, and I put two things together. One was Maurice said that the North Division was not very physical. Uh, And the other thing, I have a lot of readers of my posts who say the North Division is the weakest division. I'm thinking that they're looking at the physicality of the other divisions and saying, because I, I, they're way smarter than I am because I can't watch one team play another team and then watch another team play another team and figure out who's going to win from from that thing. I, I just, I'm not that good at it. But I th- what's more, what, where's the vision of the Jets? Because I think if they're going to make some trades, they may go for physicality. If they're, go- if they're looking past getting out of the North Division, if getting out of the North Division is good enough for this COVID-infected year, then I think they'll, they may leave it as it is. But if they, are, they think they're, if they see that they're going to have a long run, I think they might 
try to bring in some phys physical nests that they haven't had before. So uh, that's where I don't, and honestly, I, I just can't figure out what the organization is thinking about how much, what's a good year for them this year? Mm -hmm. And are they, because next year is better <laughs> and uh, you can see it coming, but uh, that's a, I think it matters to them uh, what, wh where's their vision? And I don't know where that is. Hmm. Josh, you get the final word of the day on the approach of the trade deadline for the Jets. Well, Mark, uh, I'm going to end with this with a bang and go in the complete opposite direction of Isaiah and say that they should not do anything at the trade deadline. And there are multiple reasons, which I will now break down. Number one, and the most obvious, because I wrote about this recently and how they should avoid a trade for Vince Dunn, is the quarantine. Um, you know, we saw it with Pierre-Luc Dubois. It, it rarely ever goes smoothly with a quarantine like that. He missed two weeks and then missed some time with injury. Um, that's, that's a big deterrent for a Canadian markets. And I know Chris Johnson from Sportsnet was, was reporting on this. That's deterring a lot of GMs right now, including Kyle Dubas from Toronto to make any trades at the bear at, 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 well now <laughs> at the moment, the second thing is, I don't think they need to really largely improve the defense by any, you know, m large margin here. You, um, not to con contradict Isaiah over there, but he mentioned Rasmus Sterling, and I don't see him fitting into the Jets system because he is also an offensive defenseman. So I don't think he would be a good fit in the system. Matthias Ekholm would be interesting as well, since Nashville has really hinted that they're tearing everything down. But again, it also comes down to the cost, which is reason number three. The Jets don't really have much to give up in terms of future assets. They don't have the greatest prospect pool. I know Heinola and Sandberg are two great prospects, but behind them, it's not it's not looking very full at the moment. So, you know, from that perspective, I think the Jets, all while they want to win now, and I think they are in win now mode, they also need to think about the future. And this is this if they do acquire someone like a Brandon Montour, like a Ristolainen, or like an Ekholm, this would probably be year three of them giving up future assets for something to help them in the in their current state. We look back in the last two years, it hasn't really worked out come playoff time due to various reasons, not necessarily because of the rentals themselves, but it just hasn't worked out plain and simple. So, you know, with a limited prospect pool and limited assets to give up, because I don't think anyone is taking Sammy Niku straight up one for one, it there's there's a lot of reasons to to go against the idea that they're gonna tr that they're going to do something at the deadline. I mean in a regular year, we might be having a very different conversation right now, but I think there are teams out there like the Leafs whose systems fit the defenseman better and then have more future assets to give up than Winnipeg. And unfortunately for the Jets, you know, they at the at the same time, they have the luxury of plugging in guys. So if Bowley is struggling, if DeMello continues to struggle, Logan Stanley has proven that he can be plugged in at any given at a moment's notice. And he is also six, seven, something like that. And he plays a super physical game. So, you know, I think relying a little bit on the prospects is a bit of a risky move because they don't have the, the added NHL experience. But as of right now, where the current Jets are at and where they want to be, I don't think it's the worst idea in the, in the, in the world to plug in their prospects here and there, even in the playoffs, because who knows, something could definitely click. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Logan Stanley is a, is, is a weak player in any stretch of the imagination. And I think he'd give a nice run at the other team's offense, uh, uh, at the other team's offensive units. So just, Overall, I there are just too many deterrents here to make a trade at the deadline. And despite the Jets having needs on that blue line, especially when it comes to depth, I think their prospects can plug the hole and bridge that gap till next year when they come into, into a full-time role. Interesting stuff, guys. Hey, Josh and Jim and Isaiah, we really thank you for joining the panel tonight and talking Winnipeg Jets with us. Appreciate your time, Mark. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks everybody. And fans, make sure again, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. You won't miss any of these interviews. We'll be back next Thursday. Same. We'll drop drop the episode sometime late morning, early afternoon. I got a lot more good stuff coming for you. So thank you for your time. Have a great week and we'll talk to you next time on the Hockey Writers Live.